There you have it, folks. Turning Point 3 has arrived. What a fantastic episode. Episode 8 of Mishoko Tensei Javis Reincarnation's second season. I really do feel like this was a great adaptation, this whole segment. I mean, gosh dang, the whole segment with Norn just got me teared up again. Such a powerful moment for Norn and her character, pushing forward despite not having strength. Really pushing onto Rudeus a sense of duty to protect those because you have the power to actually do it. It's such a great little segment, and when I read it, it got me teary-eyed. And here again, like, Norn, such a good character. I just absolutely love her character. But yes, we also got Cliff making some diapers, some sumo diapers for El Nolis. Well, at the same time, over here, she's talking about breaking up with him. Boy's working super hard, and Elise is looking to leave, which is really kind of a sad state for her character, really, honestly. We also had Aisha acting like a little devil. <laughs> I love those little segments. And yes, of course, Sylphie is pregnant. Pachi, 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 pachi. The shut-in virgin is going to become a father, which is absolutely fantastic. But yes, happy Mishuko Sundays, everybody. Welcome back to yet another impression slash skip content video. I'm going to go over my impressions of episode 18 itself, as well as give you any skip content that unfortunately got cut from the novels. This episode honestly was a very good adaptation. They covered all the major points. However, they unfortunately condensed a lot of Rudeus' conflict that he's going through right now. Again, he's pretty much found his ideal life right now, and now something has come in and just thrown a wrench in it. A real turning point, as you might call it. They also did skip over a lot around Norn and Rudeus and what they're currently doing right now, him helping her and them setting up this new project for Rajard. And yes, a lot, a lot of stuff around Nanahoshi. So if you like a lot of the mechanics of the world itself, they unfortunately skipped a lot of that. But again, we're going to go through all that. So without further ado, let's just jump right into it. Opening up the episode, we see a little bit of an aftermath from the whole situation with Norn and what she was going through and Rudeus helping her out. Yes, even though she hesitates, I like that little cute hesitation they put in her walk. She still weighs at him. <laughs> it was technically right here in the novel series pointing out the fact that she's made new friends. She now has three friends that are girls and two boys. He really badly wanted to meet them and actually invite them back to his place, but she flatly refused. <laughs> Guessing that she was a little bit too embarrassed about the idea. Thankfully, the whole aspect of him barging into her classroom didn't cause her any problems. They were getting along so much that she actually asked him to tutor her. He chose to tutor her at the library because he's afraid that he caused Aisha to be a little jealous. He knows that she was trying hard to keep up, but struggling to put the theories from her textbook into practice. Still, she wasn't as bad as Edis or Ghislaine. With effort, she could end up average level in no time. That's when, yes, she brings up Rajard. Specifically, she says, by the way, Rajard said that he was from the Bobbynos area, right? I know you were in the demon continent for a while, Rudius. Do you know where that is? He said, hmm, not off the top of my head. I think he said it was close to the Bigoa region. I've never been there myself, though. They were able to have a casual conversation now, but it was mostly about Rajard. It seemed that he was their common interest. Reese was happy to have someone else he could talk to about Rajard with. After Norn inquired, Reese explained how the demon continent was full of big monsters. Culture was different, but had similarities with regions that they were in. Ordinary folks living ordinary lives. At this point, he notes that Norn was still speaking overly polite, despite him getting more informal with Aisha. He guessed she just felt more comfortable that way now. They talked about the stories of Rajard and the Spears, both hoping that he would realize his goal. This reminded Rudius that it was time to move forward with his project with the figurines and the books. Again, reminder, Rudius wanted to write a book, some sort of book, and actually sell that along with the Rajard figurines. Not just to help his reputation by getting his name out there, but actually have a story to tell the true story of Rajard and the Spears. Reese at this time was struggling to get time to learn advanced healing and intermediate detoxification. Though he wasn't sure what to move on to next. Maybe to achieve saint level fire or wind magic. But those mostly seemed to involve dramatic manipulations of the climate, rather than the practical spells that you can use on a regular basis. Instead, he could probably spend more time writing his book about the Superds. However, putting pen to paper was hard. He wasn't sure if he wanted to go with a style of documentary or a diary. Possibly a short booklet that was easy to hand out and consume. He wanted a simple good versus evil story, with Laplace revealed as a true enemy. But folks of the demon continent who seen Laplace as a hero may not like it. He has kind of a problem that he runs into, despite the fact that he's trying to help everybody else by seeing that, yes, this common enemy is, is the enemy. <laughs> it's like over here, yes, technically there's some people on the demon continent who still revere Laplace as being their hero. He was the demon that was leading their army to go against the oppression of the humans. One day, Norn inquired what he was working on. Problem he was having is he didn't know where to start the book, and it was some time since he had heard the story. Norn asked if she could help out. An unexpected offer, but apparently Rajard had a habit of putting Norn on his lap, patting her on the head, and telling stories of his past. Reese felt that was not fair. He never got to sit on Rajard's lap. <laughs> No, wait, he had to be an adult about this. He agreed to let Norn help, as long as she didn't neglect her studies. Her writing was childish at times, but reading it made him vividly remember Rajard. Rudius began to tear up. The more he read, the more he felt that she had a talent for this. For the moment, he focused on fixing minor mistakes and clumsy sentences. 
He was basically the team editor now. He felt it would probably turn out to be better than what he wrote himself. So Norn is becoming an author to tell the story of Jurd and all of his travels. I do like the fact that he gets so emotional right here. He's like, oh gosh, I remember the guy. It takes him back to the days that he was traveling around with Rajurd and how much he loved Rajurd. Everybody loves Rajurd, let's be honest. But yeah, it's a very, very interesting little bit there. That's when we cut over to Aisha, the date with Aisha, <laughs> which I do find this, this little segment was really well done in the anime. There was a side of me that kind of felt like the shots of Aisha looking up at Rudius could have been done a little better because I didn't get that nice sense of her like being flirtatious that I got from the first season, but... It was still good. I, it, she's just a little devil. Any moment with Rudius and Aisha is just pure gold. While Norn and Aisha were still not friendly with each other, Aisha was superficially polite when Norn came to visit. Aisha was being careful not to insult her sister due to his scolding. This concerned Rudius a bit. He didn't want Aisha to feel like she couldn't express her real thoughts. Yeah, I think because he basically got an Aisha, stop insulting Norn, especially with her knowledge and her ability to do things. He feels like it had a reverse effect and now suddenly she's kind of bottling everything up. He wants her to be selfish. <laughs> That's why he presents to her, yay, do you want anything? Do you think I'm spending too much time with Norn? Are you feeling starved for attention? Do you want a vacation? Do you want to stay you know, in bed all day? Just let me know. But yes, the one thing she asked for <laughs> is a salary. Now, they didn't cover it, but yes, he technically went to, you know, Sylphie first and said, hey, she wants to ask for a salary. What should we figure out? They kind of talked it over and they presented her with like an actual amount. But she actually asked for a smaller figure. Like she was being very mature for her age. She wasn't asking for a lot. She just wanted a simple amount. But now when he inquires what Aisha wanted the money for, she ropes him into a date. <laughs> yes, a date with his little sister. Honestly, when they were walking towards a market district, he was fearing that she wanted to buy a macho man slave. <laughs> Which he wasn't fond about having the idea around in their house. Yes, they go to the general store. That's where she picks up the flower pots. She didn't really strike him as the flower girl type. She was always the energetic baby genius. He assumed that her hobbies were cleaning, counting money, and balancing budgets. Growing plants was a more slow, contemplative hobby. Letting nature take its course. And even a genius wasn't going to be 100% successful. But he figured that's what appealed to her. Being so used to manipulating things to her liking. <laughs> But yeah, when he inquired about the soil, she's like, oh yeah, you can just create it with your, your earth magic, can't you? Please. <laughs> you won't be able to do that. Like, <laughs> this is where it all starts. This is where the manipulation begins. He did note that, yes, some of the, the seed that she did get during her travels might not actually grow in the northern region. Because, yes, it's a, it's a very cold region. But she wasn't concerned about it. That's when he buys the earrings and she mentions the fact that he loves Sylphie so much and that he could share some of that love with her once again. Is that a bad idea? <laughs> He's like, no, father beat me senseless. <laughs> they go to the clothing store and that's where she drops not only Rudius's name, but Ariel's name, which is pretty crafty for her, but it did get the price down to exactly what she had. And this is the point which he kind of warns her about saving her own money in case there's some sort of unexpected expenses. Ruiz even notes in his own mind that at this point, he's been stashing away money in his clothes since the displacement incident. Now, for those that don't remember, that's technically what Paul did. When Paul was displaced, he immediately had the money on hand because as an adventurer, he always kept money stashed away. And that seems to be what Ruiz is doing now. Since the whole displacement incident happened, he's kind of learned to stash away some money in case something like that ever happens again. So it's kind of like him taking after his own father. But yeah, this is where Rudius finds out that Aisha apparently always liked cute things. It's just unfortunately her mother never allowed it. Lilia said that it was wrong to decorate based on your own personal taste as a maiden. But yes, this whole experience obviously did teach Rudius that not only was Aisha clever, but she was really good at playing on emotions. As she pleaded with him with her Bambi eyes that she could decorate her room, he said, of course, it's totally fine. It was a good thing that he wasn't a creepy old man or anything. He would have to kidnap her on the spot. Weeks following their date, Aisha's room grew more girly. She seemed to like cute, tiny things, plants, dolls, and even started embroidering charming designs on her apron. He was afraid that she'd evolve into a gyaru. <laughs> Still, both his sisters were doing well, and he was content. I love this whole segment, because again, it's, it's kind of like Aisha now that she's there, and she was, she was going into a role really well. She's doing a really great job being a maid, taking care of everything, you know, at being attentive to people. But it's that point where Rudius goes, hey, be selfish. If you want something, take it. And she'll say, okay, I'll do that. And that's when she goes out and basically just completely decorates her room. She's finally able to be what she wants to be. She's always been under her mother, who has always been constantly forming her to basically be her, to always be attentive to her master. And now finally, 
Aisha can be a kid. <laughs> and it's kind of it's kind of heartwarming, that idea. It's like, oh my gosh, these are the simple things. Just putting up curtains in a room, as you see in the anime, she's super happy about it because she can finally be what she wants to be. It's super cute. But yes, that's when we get into Nanahoshi, visiting Nanahoshi. And again, like I said, they, they covered the basics here, the fact that she's you know, going forward with her thing. She's asking for more help. She gives over the the reward for helping her out, which is the lamplight spirit. But there's so much here. And unfortunately, with the subtitles that I got, it didn't have, like, even the layout of what they're doing even translated. So let's dive into it. Nanahoshi was getting back into her groove. The bottle from the last successful experiment was sitting on the windowsill with a single flower in it, which we just get to see that on the table, which, yes, was in the OP as well. <laughs> that was one of those things when I seen it in the OP, I wasn't sure exactly what it was. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's in a bottle. It's in the PT bottle. <laughs> it was a success that improved her trust with Brutius, leading her to be more clear about her plans. The layout of the plans was this. Summon an inorganic object. Summon something composed of an organic matter. Summon a living thing, a plant or a small animal. Summon a living thing that fits a certain specific criteria. And then return a summon living thing to its previous location. So this is a step-by-step -step process. She's going from object to something that's organic to something that is a living thing. Then a living thing that is specific, which we'll get into in a minute, and then send it back. And once they have that whole thing laid out, she's going to be comfortable enough with you know, doing it herself. And this is all in the layout of the summoning spell itself. She's having to like tweak it and, and turn this thing and adjust this. And she's figuring out exactly what actually changes certain things. It's almost like she's creating a formula or a set of code that is specifically trying to target an object or a certain thing or how it's laid out or where it's at. So yes, her next goal, summon organic matter from their old world. She figured they could start with food. While the bottle wasn't entirely inorganic material, depending on how you defined it, she wasn't concerned about that. It seemed that her specific criteria was to ensure that she summoned something complex as a human being. And with pinpoint accuracy, as to not end up somewhere foreign. Yeah, because she doesn't want to, like, send herself back over there and, I don't know, she's in the middle of a desert or she's in, I don't know, the middle of the jungle in Africa or something like that. She was already capable of setting some conditions on what she summoned, but it was fairly broad. Like, summoning a cat could get anything from a house cat to a panther. That's where it's going to the specific criteria. Like, yes, the species, but what, what of that species? Her research now focused on making it more precise. She ended up muttering about how defining conditions was tricky. Again, that's all about that aspect of like tweaking the circle in a certain way and getting that code exact. And yes, now she's basically doing layers. That's when she brings up the idea that she needs to go see the old man again at some point. I don't know if the anime before this has ever mentioned the old man, but yes, it was somebody that she met during her travels with Orsted when she initially was traveling around with Orsted and meeting a bunch of people and traveling around the world before she ended up at the university, she met somebody that was like a specialist in summoning magic. Maurice asked if this guy knew a lot about this conditional summoning. She said, well, let me elaborate a little bit. In this world, summoning magic is generally divided between fiend summoning and spirit summoning. Fiend summoning called for specific monsters. You'd summon intelligent creatures using complex sets of magic circles in compensation. This is what people generally thought of when you used the word. Usually it meant summoning monsters encountered in the world, but it was possible to summon legendary beasts believed to reside in other worlds. It wasn't limited to monsters. It was possible to target inanimate objects. Nanahoshi produced a plastic bottle with what would technically be categorized as fiend summoning spell. If Rudis mastered this, he figured that he may be able to summon the ponsu master Roxy was wearing. <laughs> So just suddenly out of nowhere, it's suddenly breezy for her. Oh my gosh. Spirit summoning was a very different kind of technique. It involved creating artificial entities out of mana. Designing these spells was similar to programming in a way. Nanahoshi warned Rudius not to discuss that part openly. Many believe that spirits are living things that reside in the barren world, and that the spell was just calling them to this one. Fiends were harder to control, unless you had the programming chops to build a complex code. You could essentially make one that could pass as a human. She's seen some at the old man's place. Again, they're pretty much specifically categorizing these are two different types of summoning co processes here. Again, what she used before, which was the fiend summoning, that's where you're summoning like something that's in the world itself. Like, okay, there's a there's a boar over here in the demon continent. You could summon it over to you. Or like they actually end up using it to is summon something from our world to this world. But the spirit summoning, that's different. That's where you're actually coding something. You're, you're, tra you're transforming your mana into an actual thing that you're, you're programming. So you can program to make a bird that flies around or a lamplight spirit. But the problem that she's pointing out here, don't say this to anybody. Don't mention what I'm telling you right now because a lot of people in this world believe that the process of doing spirit summoning is summoning a spirit. So if you were to summon a lamplight spirit, 
you're summoning a spirit from this barren world. And so it's almost like taboo to say that because some people believe that you're summoning, you know, the spirit of a human or a spirit of a, a beast or something like that from another plane. Anyways, that's the point in which Nanahoshi hands over her reward for him helping her out, which is the lamplight spirit. It was a simple thing that flowed behind the summoner emitting a bright light. It could also understand simple commands as well. It wasn't the most exciting spell Ruiz had ever learned, and he was expecting something a little flashier as a reward. She said this magic circle is an original creation of the old man I keep talking about, by the way. Not even the Magician's Guild knows about it. Hearing this, Rudius <laughs> realized, it's, so it's a limited edition. So he's like, he's st I'm still Japanese. <laughs> he's like stashing away. He's all excited. He's got a limited edition scroll. But yeah, that's the point where she promises him something more special next time and asks him to continue to help her out. But she also pointed out that if he used his earth magic to create a template or design for that lamplight spirit, she figures that he can create a whole bunch of them and actually sell them to the Magician's Guild. When he asked if it was okay that he actually sells copies, wondering if it would actually upset the old man that made it, she said, trust me, he's got bigger things on his mind. I doubt he'd even care. If he decided to sell them to the guild, make sure you mention my name, Silent Seven Star. That should ensure they don't rip you off. So yeah, now Rudius has another thing to stick in his back pocket as a way to make money, you know, like making figurines or something like that. Now he's got the lamplight spirits. This is when we get into talking about the laws of the universe. Nanahoshi, for those who don't know, it's kind of mostly kind of shown here is very careful about what she's doing. Even though she has brought a lot of niceties of his previous, the previous world to this new world, she's being very careful. And I think she's mentioned before the idea that she doesn't really do a lot of things that are like for benefit of society. She's just doing things that she needs as a nicety. Rudius asked Nanahoshi at this point if they can bring useful stuff from their world, but she was keeping them to objects composed of single consistent substances. However, the range of possibilities was wide. With them summoning just a bottle and not the cap or the label, it might be possible to summon individual items and piece them together. Still, she warned against pulling too many things to their world. If he wanted to take chances in messing with the laws of the universe, he'd have to do it once she was back home safe. <laughs> She's like, you're gonna mess up things. You're gonna, you're gonna cause some, the laws of the universe to get angry. But that's all the stuff around Nanahoshi, which again, I always found very fascinating. I love, mostly around Nanahoshi, really get into the ideas, or it's mostly theories, let's be honest. It's Nanahoshi trying to figure out the theories of the world and yes, the summoning magic itself, but it sort of opens the door to things like different summoning processes and whatnot. But yes, Rudy's ends up going over to visit Zenobia at this point. Yes, he made the red worm, which he gave to Julie. Julie's super happy and <laughs> she's thanking everybody. Looks super cute. Rudy's ends up mentioning the fact that yes, Ginger is now living nearby and she's pretty much acting like a wife. <laughs> He did kind of note the idea that was odd that she wasn't actually living in the next door chambers because yes, typically with the dorms in certain dorms, if a person of high status has a servant, they will actually live in a chambers that's next to or aside by the dorm itself. But she wasn't actually doing that. She was actually commuting to work every single day. But it was good, yes, because now she's helping out Julie, helping her with her manners, helping with her, her speech and all that kind of stuff, you know, getting onto her whenever she messes up, which has definitely helped her improve. And yes, Rudius ends up asking Jinder why she swore loyalty to Zenoba, which this is like that little sad part of it, like how loyal she is to Zenoba. Again, technically with the whole situation with Sharon, she was loyal to him. And then yes, he, like the anime shows you, he sold her off for a Roxy figurine. He was the, he, she was his only subordinate and he ended up trading her for the Roxy figurine. But yes, after everything that happened with Pax, she ended up wanting to go back to be with Zenoba despite that. But yes, his mother asked her to, you know, take care of Zenoba, which she took proudly. And yes, this is kind of what getting that little area where Ruiz doesn't understand things. Like it doesn't seem like Zenoba treats her very well. Again, sold her off to a four figuring, but he figures that it was very serious business to swear an oath. Though he had read in a manga once that feudal society was composed of a few natural born sadists and a great number of masochists. Maybe Ginger fell in that second category. It made sense, but it was probably not true. Poor Ginger, she tries so hard. I was kind of thinking in this little section we might cover the skip chapter, which is about Ginger and Zenoba, but I might cover that in a video later. It's a very short chapter. That's when we go to Cliff and we get to see the diaper that he's been working on. <laughs> yes, he's been working on a prototype magical tool that will help Elise with her curse. Again, for those that don't remember, Elise has to you know, do it on a regular basis to fight back this curse. And if she doesn't, it will start to make her have like fevers and whatnot. She will eventually die. So he's trying to get her something that will kind of calm that down. She doesn't have to worry about doing that. But yes, it turned out so big. It looks like literally a sumo diaper. <laughs> the details of the magic item was complex. A lot of it dealing with how he aligned the external mana with the frequency of the curse's mana in a specific way. In the end, 
he found a way to make the curse less severe. But yes, the only problem is that it was a bulky sumo wrestler thing and that he didn't know that he was trying to make a smaller one. Zenoba and Nanahoshi are helping him out to kind of make it smaller. He kind of wants to make it pretty much the same, no larger than what your ordinary pair of panties would be actually be. And it was sad because, yes, technically she was perfectly fine with wearing it. And he's like, but no, I would never I would never ask her to wear this big bulky thing. And yes, the other problem is that Rudy's has to feed it man on a regular basis. Cliff, when he uses his mana on it, it's not even lasting very long. But this all kind of opens the door to something else. Rudy is like, okay, wow, Cliff has actually made something like this that is dealing with the curse that Annalise is dealing with. If he's actually successful in this, that can actually work for other cases. And what's the other one that comes to mind is obviously Zenoba. Zenoba currently right now has a, yes, this, this, what he has is classified as a blessing, but it, it's more of a curse for him because he can't deal with things. What he wants to do is you know, work with integral things and tools and sculpt and whatnot, and he's got too much strength, so he's destroying it. So Reese here is figuring, oh, well, that'd be cool if we can actually make, like, a pair of gloves that will cause him not to have as much strength in his hands. That way he can make his own figurines. But yeah, wrapping up the conversation with Cliff, it, they do note that despite the fact that this is helping out Elise, it doesn't take away the fact that she's still horny. <laughs> it's great. But yes, following all this, we get to see that Rudius is now enjoying his pleasant new life. Everything's going well. He's getting into a rhythm. He's going to work. He's doing his workouts. He's going to the university. He's, you know, you know, hanging out with Sylphie. They're having bedtime. Everything, everything is working out great. He's now finally getting to a point where his life is feeling like he's fulfilled. This is literally a life that Rudius never felt that he was going to have in his previous life. This is something completely different. He's finally achieved something he's always been looking for. But that's when the novel readers get a chapter called Turning Point 3. <laughs> yes, the third turning point hits right here. And, of course, the big thing that hits right immediately is, yes, we find out that Sylphie is pregnant. And this is, like, a very emotional point for Rudius. I mean, everything before now with the context of Rudius and Sylphie has been, I just want to get, I just want the symbol of our love. I want to get her pregnant. And a lot of it doesn't really feel like he's wanting a child, but Sylphie has always seen that he wants a child. So this is a big thing for, especially for Sylphie. He's, she's finally able to provide to him what she feels that he's always wanted. He's wanted a child, and she's felt like this is the thing that I need to provide to him. But the problem is, yes, she's an elf, so they don't really get pregnant that easy. But yes, sadly, there's so much of the inner dialogue, obviously, since it's from a novel to an anime that they're kind of skipping. So yes, when they announced the fact that she's pregnant, he felt a surge of emotion. He had to repress the urge to shout incoherently. He was going to be a dad. It didn't feel real, but it made him incredibly happy. But those words felt inadequate. I should have snapped him back into reality, asking if there was something that he'd like to say to his wife. He settled on simply thanking her. <laughs> While puzzled, she smiled. He wondered if he chose wrong. But his only example that he ever had in his life was Paul saying something like, well done, or nice job. <laughs> he struggled for the right words. He said, I'm sorry. I don't uh, think I know what to say. Sorry, Sylphie. He threw his arms around Sylphie rather than continuing. He resisted swinging her around as she now carried their baby. And then, yes, he decided to cop a fill on both ends. <laughs> the anime only showed one end, but yes, he decided to cop a fill before Aisha's like, <clears throat> excuse me, you need to stop. You, just, you need to make sure to refrain yourself going forward. <laughs> Don't push her. Reese realized that it was a good idea that he had self-control. He agreed with Aisha, who offered her own services if she needed it, but he flatly denied her into a pout. Besides the moral issues, he wasn't attracted to Aisha which suited him. He didn't need to ruin his marriage by getting with his maid, like somebody else did, like <laughs> Paul did. Aisha then left to inform Princess Ariel and Reese instead, insisting that he and Sylphie had some time alone. Alone, he wasn't sure where to begin. He thought about saying, I'll take responsibility, but they were already married. It didn't make sense. I'm Sylphie. I know this might be tough, but we'll do it together. She said, well, I think I'll be doing most of the work. She laughed softly, laying her head down on his lap. She wondered if it would be a boy or a girl. A boy would be nice, an heir to the family, but he could pass everything down to a girl just as easily. In his old life, Rudis would say, a girl with a creepy grin. What a foolish man he used to be. Right now, he couldn't find a reason to prefer one or the other, as long as it was a healthy, happy kid. Sylphie was relieved. She felt like she was really his wife now. Having kids was a major reason for marriage. Here, just like in his old world, she must have been anxious about that part. While Sylphie felt like Rudis would have it tough, but being unable to do it all the time like before, he figured he'd be fine, unlike a certain old man that he could mention. Again, Paul. <laughs> he told Sylphie to kick him out if he ever slept with another woman. But she said that she wouldn't be angry. Just a little sad. This surprised Rudius. A bit mild of a reaction. He'd feel like crap if Sylphie ever cheated on him. After Rudius said that he'd be upset if she ever messed with another guy, 
She laughed softly and smiled, an expression she only wore around him. No one else got to see it, and it made him really happy. That was a, that was a very good little segment that I forgot that the anime completely kind of glossed over, but yeah. After this, Aisha returned with Norn in tow, and yes, a full-on report of everything that she did. Like, she went around to everybody and, and set up schedules and everything. It was great. Aisha apparently convinced everyone to wait before coming to congratulate, a reasonable choice that she made on her own. Ariel also told Aisha that Sylphie could take two years off of guard duty, and Elise would volunteer to assume guard in the meantime. And also, Ariel said that she'd arrange some time for her to take off of school. Aisha then laid out everyone's schedule and when they would visit, with great detail. She was like a personal secretary. After thanking her, Aisha turned to Norn with a prideful smirk. I love that. Norn only made her gaze with a frown. <laughs> See? He likes me more. <laughs> They're always comp they're still competing. It's so cute. It seemed like they were still squabbling, but it could be a sign of how close they were. As long as it didn't turn out to be a cold war, it should be fine. They never said anything cruel when they fought, at least. When Marius murmured that Paul would be shocked if he found out, Norn's face lit up when he mentioned him. She really did love her dad. She'd probably put down marrying her dad as her dreams for the future. <laughs> She's definitely a daddy's girl. She's definitely a daddy's girl. But yes, I did love this whole segment because it's got, it has that little moment where suddenly Rudius mentions to Aisha and Norn how much their dad loves them. It's like this whole thing of like, yes, when Rudius was growing up, he noticed that Paul was always doting on them and just, just spoiling them rotten. And then he mentions that to Aisha and Norn. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? They're like, they, they just, it's not even their memories. Which is just a sad reality because Aisha... After the displacement incident, she was displaced with Lilia. Yes, Norn was with her father, but her father was, yes, working the entire time. He was he was drinking half the time. He was trying to find their family. It wasn't like he's sitting there doting on her constantly. But yes, the sad reality here is like he's sitting there going, okay, great. This is this is the life that I wanted. I have my family here. I have a child on the way. You know, I can't wait till Paul comes back with, you know, Zenith and Lilia. And we're just going to be one big happy family. This is literally the dream that he's been kind of fighting for ever since back in Buena Village. He was like, my life is together again. After this displacement a long time ago, life is finally back together again. But then, Geese's letter shows up. <laughs> yes, a very brief and very to-the-point letter, having trouble rescuing Zenith, requesting help. That's it. Oof. <laughs> Oof. Not only that, noting that, yes, this letter was dated six months ago. So it's been half a year since Geese wrote this letter. Immediately upon reading those words... Yes. We get the next visit from the man god. It has been it has been a long time. He has not had a visit from the man god since back when he told him to go to the university. Go to the university and you'll find a cure for your issue, look in the displacement incident, all that stuff. I have a feeling like every time the animators are actually doing the man god segments, they're making them more and more goofy. <laughs> I mean, the last time that we had with the with part uh, with core 1, you had him shaking his butt. <laughs> It's just, it's dorky. In the novel, it does note a little bit of internal dialogue. Rudy's here, obviously finding himself in the white space, going back to his old self. And again, having such a long time since he's had to see this old self. Yes, he's back to his old foul self that he used to be. He felt a surge of anger and resentment wash over him. It's like, I wish I didn't have to see this old self. I'm now Rudy's gray rat. And I am, you know, this guy that's fit. I've been working out all the time. I have a wife. I have a great family. And now I'm back to being this old self. It's just like a massive reminder for him every time he has to see this self. But yeah, the anime covered this conversation pretty much perfectly. He's mad at the man god. You lied to me. You said that I regret it if I didn't go. Now I have this letter from Geese. Things aren't going well over there. What the hell? Man god basically tells him, yeah, it's still the case. If you go there now, you're going to regret it. I did like the fact that right here, Rudy kind of points out, so what you're basically saying is that I'm going to regret it if I go, and I'm going to regret it if I don't. But the man god lays out a bunch of different issues that he's going to face if he does leave. Again, you're going to regret the fact that you have a child in the way. There's all these things that you're going to you're going to have a problem with if you leave. And that all eventually leads to, yes, like I think every single time <laughs> he says, I have some advice for you. Okay, go ahead. Yes, <laughs> Remain in Renoa until the next mating season comes around. Lenia and Persina will pursue you aggressively. Choose one of them and begin a relationship with her. <laughs> that will bring you great happiness in the end. Let's go. He's got the seal of approval from the man god, Rudius. You have to get with one of the, the you have to get with the cat girl or the dog girl. If you don't, you'll regret it. <laughs> you need to get with one of these two. I was uh, that was great. When I when I read that initially, I'm like, yes, 
We got it. We got it. Let's go, boys. But now, Rudia says, what the hell? You're going to have me cheat on my wife now? <laughs> what the hell? I'm happy with Sylvie. I'm not going to become a two-timer. What the hell? Uh, yeah, but they, he kicks him out. Of course. After he gives his advice, he always have to kick you out, Rudius. But yes, after this, this begins like this spiral of conflict. He just got the letter and then he has this conversation with Mangod. And now he's in bed and Sylvie's saying that he's mumbling in his sleep. And he's pressured right here. He's got his wife right here who's pregnant and he doesn't want to leave her. But they have this situation going on. His family's in danger. The letter was alarming, but he had the word from the man God to consider. What if Geese and Paul just passed each other on the road? The letter wasn't from Paul. Maybe Geese sent it in a panic. Was Geese helping to rescue Zenith as well? Paul never mentioned Geese in his letters. Perhaps Geese had found Zenith on his own. The letter was sent six months ago. It was possible that he was alone and sent the letter before Paul came to him. These were all possibilities, of course. He had no way of knowing the situation completely. Now, this is a this is a very big problem that this world has. They don't have cell phones or whatever. Like, they send a letter, it takes forever to get to somebody. So anything can happen that time. He also had a child to think about. With such a journey, he wouldn't be back home for at least a year. He couldn't just leave a pregnant wife alone and go on some adventure. As Sylphie asked about the letter, he couldn't bring himself to answer. He promised he wouldn't disappear again. It wouldn't be technically disappearing if he explained everything. Yeah, the reminder, yes, at some point right after, you know, Sylphie, you know, admitted that she is Sylphie and they were finally back together and they were reunited. The thing that she said is, please don't disappear on me again. That's all she asks. Again, because she's got that fear of just like before with Blaine of Village. He just suddenly one day disappears. And yes, the whole displacement incident happens. Even if they talked or he left a thorough letter, it would still be agonizing to Sylphie if he left her behind. Sylphie was anxious. She was pregnant and it was her first time. Her belly got bigger by the day and soon she wouldn't be able to move on her own. There was also the chance that he could die on his journey, never coming back. She fought down fear to speak the words. Rudy, you don't have to worry about me so much, okay? I've got Aisha here to take care of me. After saying that he wouldn't leave her, she smiled with a hint of confliction. The words of the man god lingered in his mind. No matter the choice, he insisted he was going to regret it. The next three days was long and difficult. Every time he seen Sylphie, Aisha, and Norn, they had anxious looks on their faces. He told them that he wasn't going to go to Begarit. But the more he thought, the more uncertain he felt. He was torn between two places. Yeah, that's the sad reality of this whole situation. It's like he's sitting here conflicted with it and Sylphie's over here and she's like, you know, you can go. Don't worry about me. And he's like, no, I'm not going to leave you. And she's got that look like, I know you want to go. You, you your family's in danger. Like, let's <laughs> be truthful. Sylphie of anybody in this story right here is going to understand the problems that come from this whole situation of not being able to help those that you want. Sylphie was stuck in... You know, with, you know, Ariel and everything like that, not knowing where her family is and waiting for word if they're still alive. And sure enough, eventually comes word, they're dead. She couldn't help them. Rudius, you have a chance to save your parents. Go to them. But no, he's like, no, I got to stay here. That's when we have the conversation with Elise. This broke my heart. This absolutely broke my heart when I read it and when I watched it. <laughs> and there's so much in here about how Elise kind of kind of blames herself for the situation. Again, to remind her, when Rudius first kind of met Elise, she told him, okay, yeah, Paul's on his way to go save Zenith. And he's like, oh, so they know where that. I'll go. And she's like, no, don't worry about it. They'll take care of it. You don't have to go. Because he had the invitation to the university. And she's basically telling him, don't worry about it. They got it handled. So keeping that in mind, yes, he brings this up. She says, yes, she got the same exact letter. They both got the same exact letter from, from Geese. And she's pretty much like already said, yeah, don't worry. I'm going. It's the duty of, you know, a grandmother to protect her do granddaughter and her husband. She had apparently received the identical letter. Unlike him, she was ready and willing to go, even if it meant leaving her life behind. He asked about her guarding Princess Ariel, though. She said there's very little danger to her life when she's enrolled in this school. She wasn't doing much of anything, to be honest. That was probably true most of the time, though you never knew when it might turn dangerous. But that was Ariel's decision to make, and Ellen Lace was basically just volunteering as a goodwill gesture. He doubt Ariel objected to her backing out. But that's when Rudy's asked about Cliff. <laughs> this hurts. She says, I'll have to leave him. He might hate me for it, but I don't have much of a choice. He said, why don't you at least explain the situation to him? I'm sure he'd understand. She shook her head with a melancholy smile. It didn't look like her usual smirk. She said, Cliff is a pure-hearted young man. He has talent, drive, and vision. It wouldn't be a surprise to me if he becomes Pope one day. He's better off remembering me as nothing but a youthful indiscretion. This is so two sides right here. It's one side that, yes, acknowledging that Cliff is a man of the cloth and he's destined to become great and he's destined to become the Pope. 
Pope of a place that probably would not accept somebody like Ellen Lace, this dirty woman. And that goes into her side of the whole situation. She just feels like her whole past again. She cannot accept the idea, or at least right now, it seems like she may be excusing the idea that somebody would actually love her. I am just a fling. He'll he'll get over me. She's been around. She's been around for a long time. She's been dealing with a lot of men. Cliff is just another one. I have to do this. He'll be fine without me. He's better off without me. That's the key thing. I'm dirty. She still feels like she's not even worthy. That's the key thing here. She doesn't feel worthy of him. Sad. That made Rius feel terrible for Cliff. Members of Millis Church were expected to remain loyal to a single person. If Annalise disappeared, it might shake the foundations of his faith. He's strong-willed, but it's hard to know what losing his religion might do to him. That's when Annalise brings up what I was mentioning earlier. And also, I'm the one who told you to stay here last time. That makes cleaning up this mess my responsibility, don't you think? She was so firm and clear that he found himself at a loss for words. Taking his silence as an agreement, she nodded. She said, you just leave this to me and wait here, dear. I want to see a happy great-grandchild waiting for me when I get back. Ruiz realized there was nothing that he could say to change her mind. Ugh, like I said, that's just a that's just a heartbreaking moment. Like I, I just I adore Elnice, my gosh. Next, he visited Zenoba. I love this section with Zenoba. He's such a bro. <laughs> it's one of those things where, like, Rudius, it almost feels like in this scene, and the anime kind of portrayed it really well. Like, he's asking Zenoba all these questions. Zenoba's like, yeah, that's fine. All right, yeah, I'll wait for you here. It, it feels like at first, it feels like Zenoba's being, you know, cold. But it almost feels like Z Rudius is trying to get Zenoba to talk him out of it. Like, oh, you think I should go? Well, that's your decision. Uh, Well, you're not not gonna go with me you're not gonna say that you have to go with me no i'm i'm terrible at traveling i would just be a burden upon you you're rudius rudius like this person that zenoba sees as being incredible like if i go with you i'm just gonna be a burden upon you but but zenoba says if you want me to go with you i would loathe to refuse like i would do it i would do it in a heartbeat to say tell me to do it but He's, he's saying, logically, it's not right for me to go. I'm just going to be a burden upon you. And then additionally, yes, after that, okay, I know what's weighing on your mind. Your child. Just, just telling you, your child will be fine. Your your baby will be born fine without you. And yes, this is from the mentality of so, a prince, you know, in the family where, yes, children that are born to a king or whatever, they just get taken off and taken care of elsewhere. They don't really have a, a, a the similar sense that somebody of a wholesome family would have, but it's still a to the point. And you know, if this is bothering you, don't worry. I'll be there in your in your place. If you're not there, I will protect your wife. I will make sure she's taken care of. Zenoba's stepping up and saying, don't worry about this. She'll be fine. We'll protect her. But yeah, with this with this in mind, this is where we go down the big massive rabbit hole of Rudius just conflicted with himself before literally one of the best scenes in this entire volume of the light novel comes up. And yes, an incredible moment in the anime itself that I just got teary eyed with. Sylphie wasn't on her own. She had Aisha, Zenoba, and Princess Ariel's retinue. She wasn't alone. We weren't alone. He weighed the options, feeling Zenoba's logic was sound. As long as Sylphie stayed healthy, everything would be fine. His presence wasn't going to make a difference. Still, that attitude didn't sit right with him. It was obviously better for Sylphie to have him there providing emotional support. Sylphie had encouraged him to go, telling him not to worry. But with it being her first pregnancy, she was probably terrified. She was probably fighting not to beg him to stay. He was the one that told her he wanted kids over and over. He may not have been serious about it at the time, but she took it seriously. And now she was actually pregnant and he was thinking about leaving her behind. It felt like a serious betrayal. There's why it gets into that again, where Rudius, he's like, yeah, it was just, I kind of just wanted that. But now it's like, gosh, dang, now she's pregnant and I don't want to leave that on her. At the same time, he had to admit that he'd been putting off his responsibility to help Paul, putting his happiness first for years. Hell. And this is this is a gut punch. <laughs> he even put fixing his performance problem over searching for his mother. Oof. I mean, it's technically true. Again, going back to the last time that he talked to the man god. The man god said, it was right after he got, again, that n knowledge about what's going on with Zenith down there. And he's like, okay, let's go. Let's go, Ellen Lee. Let's, let's go. And then he gets to talk to the man god. And the man, man god tells him, you, you're going to regret it if you go there. Don't go there. You're going to regret it. But I have advice for you. Go to the university. There, look at the displacement incident. And you'll find a cure for your manhood. 
What happened after that? Click. Time to go to the university. And right here, he's acknowledging, yeah, if I think about it, I chose my manhood over going to search for mother. I could have gone and helped. I didn't do this. And again, he's angry at the man god because you lied to me. They need my help. He's like, no, nothing changed. You're going to regret if you go there. That's the thing he's trying to drill into Ruiz's head. At the same time, Ruiz is going, that does technically make sense that I chose this over my mother. Maybe this was a wake-up call. That said, he couldn't make up his mind. Both options would cost him greatly. Now, the fourth day after the letter arrived, he spent most of it brooding over it, not sleeping well or training, just sitting around the first floor, bleary-eyed, doing nothing in particular. That's when Norn opens the front door. <laughs> Oh, uh, she had a large bag on her back. Same one he used during his days of adventuring. And it was packed and bursting. Spending some time looking at her, she avoided his gaze. <laughs> she looked like a kid caught red-handed playing a prank. Where are you off to? She didn't answer. Where are you going, Norn? She bit her lip, looking him in the eyes. Well, if you're not going to go help, Rudius, I guess I have to go instead. Oh my gosh. He thought, where? Beggar it? She was only 10. There was no way that bag had anything in it that she needed for the trip. Did she have the money or wits to spend it wisely? What route would she take? How would she deal with the dangers? She could get kidnapped and sold by slavers. No one, I can't let you do that. Rudy, please. Mom and dad are in trouble. Why aren't you going to help them? The Rudy's thought of the reasons. His wife. His child. You're much stronger than me, Rudius. You know how to travel. Why aren't you going? She wasn't wrong. He was experienced and could hold his own in the fight. As he was today, he could probably travel the demon continent without Roger's help. It was true, he could if he wanted to. He was weighing the pros and the cons for days now, but that was because he could afford to choose. That's the line, that's the line that got me when I read it. But that was because he could choose to afford. Norn didn't have that choice. She wanted to help, but she couldn't. He could have the ability to help their parents and make it back safely. That was why Geese sent the letter to him and not someone else. Yes, he just sent it to Elise, but to Rudius, and not someone else. Okay, Norn, you're right. There was people that could look after Sylvie, but he was the only one who could save his parents. He could cut through the beggar continent to Rapon. He could solve the problems Paul and the others ran into. There wasn't anyone else that he could trust for that job. I'll go. Can you look after the house for me? She lit up, but then squeezed her lips together, nodding with a serious expression. Absolutely. Don't fight with Aisha. And help Sylvie when you can, okay? Of course. All right, good girl. He felt terrible doing this to Sylphie and their baby. If she dumped him, he wouldn't blame her. But that wasn't how he should be thinking about this. He needed to trust his wife. And so, he made up his mind to save his parents. Ugh! That all that last scene. I I love how the animator are falling over. No, I walk it out there. I, I love it because it, when I read it, it, it kind of played out exactly in my mind how the anime played it. Just the door opens and she's like, oh, crap, I got, I got caught. She got that whole backpack on. She's like, it's like, just like with Rudius, you're seeing it and you're going, girl, you're never going to make it. You, you're not even going to make it two miles out of the town. But the problem is that Norn sees Rudius, you know, brooding over trying to figure out what he's going to do. And she's like, if you're not going to do it, I'll do it. But it all comes down to that aspect of what she sort of snaps into Rudius's mind. Norn is right here doing sort of the logical thing. I, she has in his shoes, <laughs> she doesn't have the power to do it, but she still has a logical thing of I, somebody needs to do something. And she deeply cares for Paul. But she has, the, the key thing to note here is she hasn't gone yet. This is four days after the letter, and she still hasn't gone. But on the fourth day, after seeing Rudius brooding around, she's realizing you're not going to do it. Dad needs my help. Mom needs my help. I'm going. It's not that she meant for him to see her. She, she got caught. You're not going to go. I'll go. And it's, it's frustrating for her because he's like, you can't do that. You're, gonna, you're in danger. You're not going to make it. You're not going to survive. And her retort to that is, but you can, and you're not. Why not? Why aren't you going to save our family when you can do it? I can't, but you can. Why aren't you doing it? Such a good scene. I love her. Just like looking up at him, just tear eyes, and it's the excitement that he's actually going to do it. And that's, that's a big, bold thing there too, because again, not just here briefly, when she first came there, she hated Rudius. Or not hated, but she, like, she, she had hatred, and that turned into fear. And that fear turned into essentially hating herself and then he was there for her 
and it completely flipped to now she is relying on him because again she's she knows how strong he is and that he could handle this and simply him saying i'll go she's not going with him you would expect norn to say i'm coming with you because i want to go help too but no she has full confidence rudy will fix this my brother will fix this that that that's kind of a a big change for her to have that confidence in her brother to do that. Anyways, such a good, good episode. Like I said, they nailed it as much as I covered a lot of stuff. A lot of it, is, again, is, is that inner conflict, that inner dialogue that really kind of cements a lot of these situations. And again, a lot of it around the, the whole thing with Nana Hoshi. But I hope you guys enjoyed this skipped content video as usual. I think they said that next week we do not have an episode. So... That's unfortunate, but we'll we'll see you guys back here once the series returns going into peak. And we're going into peak after this. We're going to travel and everything. It is going to be amazing. There's a couple things that I'm kind of concerned they're not going to cover, which does break my heart. A lot of the travel I think they might be cutting, but I'll still be here for you guys to give you the full context of everything that happens in the novel series that they're going to be skipping. So I hope you guys will stick around. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. As always, if you did, make sure that like button down below. Comment. Let me know what's the episode. I just leave you new to the channel. Make sure that subscribe button to get my content. I do news, reviews, first impressions, top list if it's animates premature. I just leave like this content and you want to support this channel more. I have a Patreon link, tips, links, so thanks, membership button down below. Greatly appreciate it does. And y'all take care.